Okay, let's see what all of this actually looks like in Excel. I've created a little problem here which deals with operations on a shop floor. I'm going to make a run of a particular size. You can see it here on the, under the X column for how many units I'm going to run. Uh, but the equipment that I'm going to make the run on requires a little time to set up and a little time to take down. And those times, the setup time and breakdown time, aren't normally distributed. Okay? Um, the actual run time is uh, a linear function of the amount of units being run. So every unit takes the same amount of time to produce. The red line over here shows you what the best average time would be for the, each, run, each possible run size. It turns out that this, the intercept of this thing is 129 and a half, and the slope is two and a half minutes, meaning that on average it takes 129 minutes to set up and tear down the equipment, and every unit that you make takes, on, it takes a two and a half minute time in order to be able to produce. But because of the uncertainty in setup and breakdown times, you can see that the blue dots that we see here aren't actually lying right on top of the red line. Instead, they're scattered somewhat around it. And the best straight line to correspond to those blue dots is the blue line that you see tilted here. Different samples would give us bl different blue dots, and those different blue dots would give us different lines that are the best fit to the blue data. Those lines cluster around, but obviously are not identical to the red line we're looking for. So the question really is, for a given data set of data, what line do we get and how much can we trust it? So I'm going to stop at this point and just grab one of these lines and see how well it does and how well we can trust the information. I'll take this set of data here. All right, now what we want to do is to get Excel to give us a report on this line and tell us how, well we, how much we can trust it. In order to do this, we have to have the data analysis tool pack installed. If you did what I said at the beginning of the semester, it's probably already on your machine. You can check by clicking on the data tab here and seeing if data analysis appears over here under the analyze group. If it doesn't, here's what you do. Go under the file tab, choose options. Under options, choose add-ins. Under add-ins, choose Excel add-ins down here, click on the Go button, and it will bring up a menu like this. You'll see Analysis and Analysis Tool Pack uh, at, at the beginning of that list. Check those things if they're not already checked, and then it might ask for your Office disk, but you're, you'll be able to install that. After you do that, that Data Analysis group will be available under the Data tab, and that's what we're going to use. On the list here, there's a bunch of things, but the one that we want is Regression. I say OK, and it's going to ask me where my X and Y values are. Now, I've already put some stuff in here, so let me clear those out and demonstrate how I get it. The Y values, obviously, are the numbers in this column here. The corresponding X values are the numbers in this column here. They're the input values. And for confidence level, it says 95% by default, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to put in 99% here. And there are some other things that you could choose to include as well, but I'm not going to do that. That'll be fine for what we're doing here in 291. So I'll say OK. And it will create a new sheet with the data. As you can see, some things are kind of cut off here, so I'm going to widen those columns a bit. I'll highlight this and double click to widen it. And uh, since I asked it for a 99% data, you'll see two columns here with that. Here's the 95%, which is the default information. If you didn't add that last column, you'll get 95, 95, 95, 95. And on the report you turn into me, you'd probably want to delete those last two columns. But here I've got different data, so I'm going to let it sit there. Let's take a closer look at this and see what's going on. The R squared value is a measure of how well the data that you see with the blue dots is explained by a straight line. Here the answer turns out to be about 78%. And that value is the same one that we saw back here on the R squared graph, 0.779. The blue points are pretty well explained by the straight line, but not perfectly. About 77% of their up and down bouncing is explained by saying they're trying to hang around the straight line. The other 21% mm, is due to the variations around that line. What else do we have here? Well, the R value, uh, this multiple R that it says, is just the square root of the R squared value here. We don't really care about it much other than that if the line were going downhill, this would be a negative 0.88 rather than a positive 0.88. I'm going to ignore these values here. Observations 10 means that there's 10 observations in our data set, 10 blue dots. This ANOVA report I'm going to ignore entirely for the moment. You won't have to worry about it, but I'll come back a little bit later and tell you why we can ignore it. All right, so here's the meat of the table down here. There are a couple columns here I'm not going to care about either. The standard error and the t-stat. Not that they aren't important, 
but they're of a statistical nature and they're not my focus in this particular video. So I'm going to fill those cells with black just to make them so that we don't have to look at them. And let's look at the rest of the table. This first column, the coefficients, tell you nothing you don't already know. This is just giving you the equation of that blue line. The slope is 2.03, the intercept about 166. And you can see those same numbers back here, 2.03, about 166. That's the blue line that we're looking at. The other stuff, however, is new. And I'm going to start over here with the 95% confidence interval part. Let me highlight that just so we remember what we're looking at. Uh, that's a bad way to highlight it. How about like that? Okay, let's start with the slope. We know that from our data, our best guess for the slope is 2.03. That's the blue line. That would be saying that making a unit takes on average 2.03 minutes. But we know that the blue line is not perfectly the red line, and we're trying to find the slope of the red line. This tells us that we're 95% confident that the slope of that red line actually is somewhere between 1.15 and 2.92. In reality, the actual slope was 2.5, so this range did in fact include the actual value of the red line slope. And the 95% confidence means that if we chose a random sample and we did exactly this procedure and got a range, like down here, 95% of the time that range will include the actual slope of the red line. 5% of the time, it will fail. On the other hand, I could, if I want to be more confident, by using with 99% confidence. The trouble with doing that is that while I'm more confident in my answer, my answer is less precise. I'm 99% sure that the red line slope is somewhere between 0.75 and 3.32. So, more confident at the cost of less certainty. Now all I can say is that the amount of time it takes to make a unit is somewhere between 0.75 minutes and 3.33 minutes. Pretty wide range. We can play the same game, by the way, with the intercept, although it's usually not as important. The best guess that we have for the intercept is 165, about 166 minutes, which would mean that if x is equal to zero, that is, if we actually didn't even do a production run, just set up and tore down the machines, it would take on average 166 minutes. But that's only our best single estimate. Our confidence number runs from 104 minutes up to 227 minutes. The, our best guess as to where the red line's intercept actually is, based on our blue dots, is somewhere in that range. The actual intercept is about 129.5. So yeah, it's inside that range. And again, we can see that with higher confidence, we can say that it's inside that range. The downside of that, the range is even wider than the range that we began with. All right, so that's the confidence intervals. All that we have left are these p-value things. What are they telling us? Well, a p-value is always dealing with a hypothesis test. And the hypothesis that we're talking about here is that these numbers over here, the blue values for the slope and intercept, if we were talking about the red values, the hypothesis is the red slope is actually zero and the red intercept is actually zero. If you look at the data back here, that seems darned unlikely. Obviously, the red line that we're actually seeing is quite tilted and doesn't have an intercept of zero. But remember that we don't have that line. All that we have are the blue dots. So could the blue dots correspond to a, a line which is actually horizontal or to a line that actually crosses right through the origin here at the y-intercept? Well, p-values represent how weird a sample would be given the null hypothesis. So let's start with the slope one, which is, again, the more important one. The p-value is extremely small, 0 0.0007, about 7 ten thousandths. What this means is this. If the slope actually were 0, another way of saying that is if there's actually no linear relationship at all between x and y, so that changing x doesn't change the average value of y, then seeing a sample that looks like it's got a slope, when it really is just random, would occur only about 7 ten thousandths of the time. So we're willing to believe that that's not true. Any p-value less than 0 0.05 is usually evidence, accepted as evidence that the slope is not really zero. That is, this number being less than 0 0.05 is telling you there is a linear relationship between the x value and the average y value. Um, the intercept, we can play the same game. The null hypothesis is this line goes through the origin. That is, the actual red line intercept is actually zero, even though our blue line has a 165. Is this believable? No. The p-value is 0 0.0002, or about two ten thousandths, meaning that if in fact the line went through the origin 
but you see data like this, the chance of seeing data points that are that given initial, that far away from the origin would only happen about about uh, two times in 10,000. Again, that's a very small value, and we would reject the null hypothesis. This ANOVA table that I was ignoring is basically just telling you, notice that the significance value here is the same as the slope's p-value here. They're exactly the same. This is just testing the idea, is there a linear relationship between the input variables and the output variable? Well, in this problem, there is only one input variable, and when that's the case, this and this are going to be exactly the same number, and that's why you can just ignore this ANOVA report. Okay, for the data that we just got here, we ended up with a confidence interval that definitely nailed the slope and nailed the intercept as well. Let's try this one more time with the original set of data that we were talking about earlier in this video. Here it is here. I've asked to compute the confidence interval information based on this graph in exactly the same way that I just did the example that we did together. Here's the result. Same kind of game. Notice that it says that it's the best guess for the line is an intercept of 65 and a slope of 3.69. The actual value of the slope was really, if you'll recall, uh, 2.5. But look at the confidence interval. 2.5 is not in there. In fact, it's not over here either. This line is a very uncommonly bad fit to the actual red line. It could happen. It turned out that in both cases, the 95% and 99% confidence interval actually missed the true value of the slope, 2.5. An uncommon thing to have at 99% confidence would expect a, a random data set to only screw up this badly one time in 100, but here's an example of where it happens. In the same kind of way, the actual intercept value is 129.5 for the red line, but our best guess is 65.6 .6 based on the blue line. Our 95% confidence interval does not contain 129.5. Our 99% one doesn't eat, well, our 99% one just barely does, 129.5. So in this particular case, you can see more easily why it's necessary to have those wide ranges, because that line looks like the data points are fitting very well along the straight line, and yet it's pretty badly missing both the slope and intercept of the actual data.